Thank you so much for having us today. We have the pleasure of bringing the discussion on the new and emerging Indo-Pacific defence requirements and how WA is positioned to meet them. So we'll start by introducing our panellists. Terry. Um, good, up, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Terry Durant and I'm the Managing Director of South Metropolitan TAFE here in Western Australia. South Metropolitan is one of five TAFE colleges in Western Australia and South Metro is the largest trainer of trade-based uh, work in the state. We train approximately 38% of the market here in trades alone. Typically, we have over 26,000 enrolments every year um, through 12 campuses. Now, some of those campuses are quite generalist in nature, but others are quite specific. So, for this audience, we have our defence um, based campus at Naval Base and also our engineering and automation campus at Munster both of which are in very close proximity to the Henderson Defence Facilities. Our partnership with Defence goes back 20 years. Um, we've been working with the ASC with Collins Class subs for most of that time and Scientific Management and Associates for Navy trade and post-trade training. I mentioned our Naval Base Campus and the Premier also mentioned that this morning. We opened that campus in May of 2019 and it's specifically to provide students and apprentices with a hands-on experience in real life industry setting, specifically around the growing shipbuilding industry. Co-located with us is also the Naval Shipbuilding Institute and we see this as mutually beneficial to meet the needs of the state and the nation. Recognising that defence is more than shipbuilding to us, we've also recently launched cyber security qualifications based at our Murdoch campus. Those cyber security qualifications for the VET sector are amongst the first in Australia and certainly within Western Australia, we're one of only two nationally to pro be providing advanced diploma qualifications in that area. As industries evolve, so do we. And for us in particular, we've been focusing on emerging technologies and some of you from Western Australia in particular may be aware of the work that we've been undertaking with Rio Tinto. And that is around automation and reskilling a workforce. So we see our role as more than just being the primary skiller, we also see a significant component of what we do as reskilling the workforce for the future. And on that reskilling and the workforce needs and being able to manage that, we've been here before. Um, South Metro, when the oil and gas industry in particular in this state ramped up operations, we trained over 4,500 people in a four year period to meet the needs of that industry. So we're very confident that we can give the state the assurance that we can do that again and be the trainer of choice when the need arises for the workforce. Michelle. Uh, yes, hi, I'm Michelle Clement. I'm the Director of the Defence Science Centre. Um, you have heard from the Premier today. The Defence Science Centre was a key recommendation of the West Australian Defence and Defence Industry Strategic Plan that was announced last year. Um, and we launched um, in June of this year, which um, it's been fantastic to have been part of that journey. The centre is a collaboration between the uh, Commonwealth through the Defence Science Technology Group of the Department of Defence, the State Government and our four public universities. Our real role is around um, collaborating between our university, our industry and defence and, and bringing those groups together to support our defence capabilities and to solve those potential defence challenges now and into the future. Um, I often describe my role as being a matchmaker between um, the, the capabilities of the universities, um, the, the government through defence and industry to really try to strengthen um, our participation in defence as business. And it's also really about trying to translate the, the research, the fantastic research that's done by our universities and even our industry into, into that um, defence supply chains and into real outcomes. 
Probably the real critical part of this, and it's been mentioned a lot today, is it's around the collaborative nature of what we're doing. Um, and that's really what the Defence Science Centre has been built on. It's around um, developing those really strong research collaborations, um, you know, so that we can provide that greater impact, build that critical mass, and provide more effectiveness um, and access to that use of knowledge um, and expertise and infrastructure that we have. But whilst we have a very much a WA focus, um, we also have a bit of a national focus and uh, we have a really good relationship with our counterparts in South Australia, New South Wales and Victoria. And to be honest, um, when we were establishing the Defence Science Centre, um, the support that um, came from Victoria through the Defence Science Institute, through South Australia, the Defence Innovation Partnership, and New South Wales with the Defence Innovation um, Network was really fantastic. You know, I didn't have to make the, the mistakes. They, they told me all the lessons they learned as they were establishing. And I think that goes a long way towards what we're trying to achieve with the Defence Science Centre and nationally about this collaboration and, and going forward to support um, the broader defence network. Great, John. Thanks, Gemma. Thanks, ladies. Well, it's a very hard act to follow. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel today. Um, uh, my name's Joel Nevin and I'm a co-director of Black Tree Technology. Black Tree is a small micro, if you like, business located in Perth. Um, we have the wonderful capability to manufacture and sustain a range of vertically integrated UHF radio to satellite components. Uh, all uh, that form a core of communications ground stations equipment uh, for UHF SATCOM. So an example of some of the things we make are very large three metre helical antennas. For those of you that have had the privilege to visit or work on uh, bases such as Stirling or Harmon in Canberra, you may have been up to Norcom in Darwin, you may see these things that appear to come out of Thunderbirds I go, large antennas sticking up on the roof. Um, that's our product made in WA. The antennas are supported on antenna pedestals. We make a motorised version and a manual version. And then there's a whole range of equipment that sit in line from the back of the radio to the tip of the antenna that provides a stronger, less noise radio signal. Uh, we're very privileged to be able to make that in WA. The, uh, as I said, in Australia, it forms the core of the UHF SATCOM network domestically, so with the ADF facilities around Australia, but we also export, so it's really been very nice to hear people from different countries here today, because our antennas are actually sitting in those countries, so we have equipment in uh, our mainland uh, in, in the UK, in the US, in Europe, there's uh, antennas in Japan, uh, in Italy as an example of Europe, so we're a small company that exports to the world, a world-leading product, a high-quality product, and a very robust product. Fantastic. So from each of your perspectives, how do you see that WA is positioning itself to meet the emerging challenges facing us? We've heard a lot of lofty ambitions today for the state as to what they'd like to achieve. How do you see us as a state positioning ourselves to achieve those outcomes? From a, an education perspective broadly, I think the state is doing um, a fantastic job of engaging the school sector, the TAFE sector and the university sector and understanding the pathways between the three of them particularly um, between TAFE and the university sector, we have extremely good relationships and those flow of graduates actually go both ways depending on the skills of industry at the time. So I think both of those sectors understanding that um, is a strength that we have in this state. Um, I also think the, the if I focus on the, the training sector, the vocational sector, I think one of our strengths is our relationship with industry. And I think all states would say that, and it's, it's true, that that's one of the strengths of the VET sector. But I think here in Western Australia, we've been able to demonstrate in a really practical way that we've worked hand in glove with industry to provide them with the training that they need when they need it. And I think we've also been able to demonstrate again in a very practical way through things like the, the Rio Tinto Automation Partnership, that we can be very agile and responsive and I think in some ways that's born by our remoteness. Um, as we know, the state is a leader in automation and a number of technologies, and I think that's made us a little bit more creative 
and a little bit more hungry in terms of meeting the needs of industry. And uh, our Guardian class patrol boat facility is very closely located to it your is, facility in Naval is. Base and you're a great partner to have in the training space. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess where I see it from, it's essential that we have like the right mechanisms in place to ensure that we, we meet the, the future um, capabilities that, that we need. And that's a combination of things. We, we need to have the right policy environment. We need to make sure we have uh, the right infra infrastructure in place, that we have the right work, workforce planning and training um, involved. And um, you can actually see that all happening now. It's all sort of lining up. We also need to have the, the, the right sort of industry and re research um, development programs. But critically, I think it's a lot about relationships, um, building those relationships and communicating, and also keeping the dialogue open about um, you know, where we want to go, what we're doing, continuing to communicate those messages about what we are doing and how we are going to achieve, and also getting that feedback back. If there are gaps here that, um, particularly speaking from um, a state government perspective, if there are gaps there, you know you need to let us know so that we can look at how we can try to resolve those going forward. Joel? Certainly from my perspective as an SME, there's two factors at play here that we're doing well. Uh, as I said, we make our product in WA, but we use a lot of small, other small businesses in our supply chain. And when you combine a group effort of many small businesses working together, small businesses that are highly skilled, agile, and based in Perth, so you have limited transit time of equipment, they play a key role in, in WA defence industry, uh, in domestic and global, to, to address the challenges of domestic and global markets. On the flip side of that is the support we've received from uh, state and federal governments. An example of some of the areas that, that support us immensely are the Team of Defence West, which put on this fabulous event today, um, the Centre for Defence Industry Capability, which supports small business through grant funding uh, and support with industry engagement. Defence industry policy is key to us because it stipulates Australian industry content. And we were very fortunate to have Linda Reynolds at our office uh, as Defence Industries Minister to launch um, a policy that provided, stipulated if you like, Australian small industry content on a lower value of contracts, so down to 2 million rather than 20. And last but not least for us is the industry support network. So Chris Consonides was here from Aden speaking earlier on the panel, and it's the connections you make through those industry groups which are vital for, uh, for your success in industry. Fantastic, thank you for that. Uh, Michelle, what role um, do you see WA playing in terms of investment to improve and better position ourselves in the te technology development and the science space? Um, it, it's a really important uh, thing. And I think where, where we can look at this for, from a start, there's already been a lot of investment made, um, but it's about how we can actually identify those technologies and actually draw them out to actually get greater outcomes from them. So it's really about translating that, that research into, into um, either businesses or into our outcomes. And there's um, a lot out there that we could probably work on. We can look at like some of the challenges that have been um, discussed today. There's issues around big data, about the, the use of those, those new technologies that we need going forward. And it's how we can develop those. Um, if, I, if I look at my sort of particular area, we're looking at developing some, some grants that will um, encourage that greater collaboration to try to support um, bids into trying to attract larger, more investment back into the state. And this is where that collaboration helps. If we can get that uh, a critical mass that can attract a larger investment from um, whether that be from primes or from the US or other, other markets, um, that's what we're, we're going to look at. But it's really about working together to, to make that investment happen. And it's also about investing in our people and in our students going forward. And one of the other options that we're looking at is how do we get more of our uh, students exposed into uh, defence industry to support that um, development of industry capability, but also to support our awareness of our students about the opportunities that are out there and that are growing into the future. And I think that's really important. Um, Joel, with SMEs, what role do you see them playing in supporting primes and then both independently on their own um, in playing to support the future of WA's defence industries and the, the programs that are coming here? Oh, it looks 
supporting primes is, is one of the critical issues for SMEs. So just from, uh, from an industry engagement, you clearly you have a great product that you want to deal with defence and you know that it's a capability that defence wants. Uh, but what we have found is at times you need that prime engagement um, to allowable them to incorporate that technology or that capability in their program and take that to the customer. So I think the part that SMEs have to play is crucial. SMEs tend to be um, very nimble and agile and, uh, and I think that's a real advantage to play there. I think we can play a key role uh, in the engagement with, with primes you know, and add a lot of value uh, as Australian industry content, but more importantly, very highly skilled and very capable. And do you find that an easy process or do you think that there's more that can be done to facilitate engagement with the primes? What's, what's your experience in that space? Oh, look, I think there's a couple of things at play. Um, again, from an SME's perspective, they have to be well informed themselves. So it's not something you can sit there and expect them to come to you. You need to be industry engaged, you need to be engaged with support networks that are out there. Uh, and I mentioned before, connecting with industry groups, that's another way of engaging with the primes. Uh, and also the likes of Defence Western Centre for Defence Industry Capability, their role is to bring primes and small business together and to make that facilitation easy. From our perspective, um, it's very crucial that state and federal government do provide guidance and assistance to industry to allow industry to understand what resources and facilities are required when dealing with defence. And I've had previous conversations on the stage today about being security aware. Um, you know, the security nature of dealing in defence is very important. And for new SMEs, that's it's quite an interesting thing. It doesn't really exist in a lot of other industries. It's very critical here. And so the assistance of government and industry groups there is, is critical. The role that um, support groups can play is bringing together those opportunities for primes and SMEs to interact. And today is a key example of that. The DNI conference in Canberra was another one. Uh, they had fantastic opportunities for, for like-minded people to get together. Uh, from my perspective, another uh, critical thing for small business to enable them to lift so that they can deal with primes in defence is the funding programs that are out there that are tailored to the cash flow requirements of small business. It's not easy to uh, all of a sudden decide that you're going to have a level two security facility. There's a fair investment in that. And assistance with grant programs is crucial to allow that to happen. And just one more point, if you'll bear with me. <laughs> um, but, but something that's very key for us is uh, ensuring that uh, the wonderful work done by Defence Policy Division actually flows down to those making the purchasing decisions. And we see a slight disconnect at times between those. You have people at, uh, at very senior levels keen to support small business, keen to support Australian industry content. It then needs to flow through to those that are issuing contracts so that they are capable of flowing that down and flowing that into SME engagement. So all companies here today need to call their procurement organisations and make sure they're talking to SMEs is the <laughs> message we're trying to get out. That would be great. Um, Terry, how do you see education and um, training providers working to ensure that we have the sufficient workforce and skills required to meet the, the ongoing needs? And how has the, the, uh, the demand kind of pivoted how you've shaped your courses? Well, most of our course development is um, led by industry. Um, to a large extent. So we certainly have industry advisory groups across a range of our industry areas to make sure that the individual elements of what we're delivering are contemporary and relevant of what industry needs. So that's, that's how we stay current. In terms of understanding um, emerging needs and workforce trends, again, we use those industry advisory groups, but we also, now through the state government, um, have an Office of Defence Skilling set up within South Metropolitan TAFE to look at the state's workforce needs around defence in particular. Now, we work at a state level for that, but we also work with the Naval Shipbuilding Institute as well uh, to look at that as a national capability. But the other thing that we're finding is related industries um, are looking at what's happening in the defence space in Western Australia and, actually, and seeing it as an opportunity not a threat in terms of workforce development. Because we have quite a number of other industries where the skills are very similar, and it may just be a, a case of some minor training or top-up training or recognition of prior learning 
that will help build that workforce as well. So we're seeing it as an opportunity. So with the mining and oil and gas sector, you see it more as a competitive advantage than a potential com competitor of competing skills? Yes, I do, absolutely. I think the skill sets are quite similar. Um, and all of those industries have large workforce needs, but, but that vary. So it's, it's very rare that they're all on and up at exactly the same time. And if, there, if that was the case, um, again, I think we have the capacity within the state to train for that. I think we also need to make sure we don't lose sight of a re-engaging workforce. So it's not just about people coming out of school or university. It's also about skills that are no longer required where we can look at retraining people into the new and emerging skills. I think that's a, a huge opportunity for this state in particular because um, of mining and oil and gas. All right, fantastic. All right, in two minutes each, your, your last question is, what is your key takeaway from the conversations at this conference so far, and how is that going to implement your thinking going forward? Joel? Oh, certainly for me, it's been really positive to, to, um, to see the SMEs come to the fore at this conference, and the, the challenge that the SME faces has been raised by many speakers, uh, both across industry and also government, and that, that's... that's truly beneficial for us because it does mean that it's going to make it easier for us to engage as time goes on. I guess what I've seen is there seems to be a, um, a mutual goal that we're all heading in the same direction. We all, we all want to make sure that we um, develop, develop a really good uh, sovereign defence defense capability and we continue to grow and develop that that we, you know, and even from a national basis, that we look at the, this of having good relations with our, with our region, but also with the rest of the world, and that we essentially um, have a really good policy background and collaboration is, is really one of those keys, um, collaboration across the whole network, and I think that's really important. Terry? This is the advantage of going last. <laughs> when, when I was about to say collaboration is, is really the key that I've taken out of this. I think the... Um, the Team WA approach that has been quite um, obvious to me both within this room and in the networking opportunities is really lovely to see. But also to see that it's more than just a WA approach. It's also that recognition that it must be, it's a national priority and the national needs are what is the priority. But within that, um, within this state, I think we have great capability. Thank you so much. I think we've had a great discussion here today about how the workforce behind the defence force and the contributing factors from industry and academia and the, and the defence space can really support the capability that we are providing to our ADF to ensuring that they have everything they need in both new acquisition purchases but also ongoing sustainment and that that is supported fundamentally by Australian industry content. So thank you ladies for your time and thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Jennifer.